Aloha mai kako, maloa lele, bula vinaka, good morning. I greet you in the worship languages of the First United Methodist Church of Honolulu, Hawaiian, Tongan, Fijian, and English. Welcome to the opening worship of the 2020 California Pacific Annual Conference Session. Please take a moment to pause, prepare your heart, mind, and soul for this time of giving our thanks and praise to God. Bonjour, mes amis. God's grace abounds even in uncertain times. The whole world awaits the good news of God's grace, mercy, and healing touch. Surely God is present in our midst as we gather today. We will be refreshed by the Holy Spirit and strengthened by the bonds of fellowship and friendship that we share. Christ's resurrection brings hope to all people. Together we will stand on the solid rock of Christ's teachings and example. Come, let us sing our praise to the glory of God. Aloha mai kako, talo falava, hula vinaka, and maloelele. We are the Pancakes and Praise Band of the First United Methodist Church of Honolulu and would like to invite you all as we sail through the Polynesian Islands singing a song of praise and glory to our Lord. God is good. This year's annual conference is We Are the Church. 
And the scripture that will carry us through these next two days comes to us from Acts chapter 4, verses 1 through 37. As you listen to the scripture reading, hear how the early church was strengthened in the name of Jesus as they praised God, boldly shared the good news, and shared one heart and one soul together. May these words continue to inspire us as we are the church. Listen now for the word of God. Let us pray. Most holy God, thank you for drawing us near to you as we begin our time of conferencing together. In faith, we are stepping into new and unfamiliar territory, meeting by Zoom, voting by computer, and discerning your will without the luxury of sitting side by side in the university chapel. As we move forward these next two days, we will be relying on your guidance and trusting in the process so that the work of your church may be done. In moments of frustration, bestow your patience upon us. In times of uncertainty, shed your light on the proceedings. When mistakes are made, grant us good humor. And when things go smoothly, let our rejoicing be heard in heaven. Thing we say and do glorify you. For we pray all this in your Son's name. Amen. While Peter and John were speaking to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came to them, much annoyed because they were teaching the people, and proclaiming that in Jesus there is the resurrection of the dead. So they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who heard the word believed, and they numbered about 5,000. The next day their rulers, elders, and scribes assembled in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. When they had made the prisoners stand in their midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Yes, by what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are questioned today because of a good deed done, to someone who was sick. And are asked how this man has been healed. Let it be known to all of you. To all of you. To all of you. And to all the people of Israel. That this man is standing before you in good health by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. The name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. The name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth whom you crucified. Crucified. Whom God raised from the dead. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you. Rejected by you. The builders. The builders. It has become the cornerstone. The cornerstone. The cornerstone. This Jesus is the cornerstone that was rejected by you, the builders. It has become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no under name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. No other name under heaven given unto among mortals by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and realized that they were uneducated and ordinary men, they were amazed and recognized them as companions of Jesus. When they saw 
the man who had been cursed standing beside them. They had nothing to say in opposition. So they ordered them to leave the council while they discussed the matter with one another. They said, what will we do with them? What will we do with them? For it is obvious to all who live in Jerusalem that a notable sign had been done through them. We cannot deny it. We cannot deny it. But to keep it from spreading further among the people. Let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. The name of Jesus. Jesus. So they called them and ordered them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in God's sight to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot keep from speaking about what we have seen and heard. After threatening them again, they let them go. Finding no way to punish them because of the people. For all of them. All of them. Praised God. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. They all praise God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing had been performed was more than 40 years old. After they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard it, they raised their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, Sovereign Lord, who made he the heaven and the earth, the heaven and the earth, the sea and everything in them, and everything in them. It is you who said by the Holy Spirit through our ancestor David, your servant. Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples imagine vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers have gathered together against the Lord and against his Messiah. For in this city, in fact, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles, and the peoples of Israel gather together against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look at their threats and grant to your servants, all of your servants, to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal. And signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. When they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And spoke the word of God with boldness. With boldness. Boldness. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace, great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them. Not one. Not one. For as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. If anyone had a need, the proceeds were distributed. There was a Levite, a native of Cyprus, Joseph, to whom the apostles gave the name Barnabas. Which means son of encouragement. He sold a field that belonged to him, then brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. At the apostles' feet. To be distributed. As anyone had need. To all who had need. The name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Once rejected, became the cornerstone. The name by which we are saved. To praise God to speak the word, 
With boldness. One heart, one soul. Together. Together.
Ya ko no nga o tua ai ang mamawa tu heta tai o ya tamai ko to ape tawange ke ne malu i homo loto momo nga fa kau kau ya klai sisu ya ke hoko a tu ai ta po ke a tu maf mafi tu a ko tamai pe moi alo moi lau mari man oni ke ya te kita tol ko to ape ya pe fa i pe ke tangata as we close this time of worship and prepare for the task that lay ahead May the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace in believing so that we may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit, for we are the church. Amen. As the California Pacific Conference of United Methodist Church gathers virtually for its annual conference on June 18th to June 20th, the CalPAC young people ask humbly that in order to show solidarity, that we observe an 8 minute and 46 second period of silence during the annual conference session in its opening worship service. Our baptismal covenant set us all on a journey of standing up against evil, injustice, and oppression. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? We do. It is at this time in history that we as young people and supporters of young people of the CalPAC Annual Conference ask its members to remember this covenant and to stand in solidarity with the black community. Eight minutes and 46 seconds was all the time that it took for George Floyd's life to be taken at the hands of the police. It is clear that systemic racism still has a strong grip over our nation. It is clear that more needs to be done. It is clear that people are upset over what has happened to black lives, such as Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and Trayvon Martin, and countless others. It is clear that more often than not, black lives matter less. This work of dismantling system, systemic racism and hatred in the church and our nation will be, never be over until black lives are deemed to be beautiful, celebrated, cherished, and fearfully and wonderfully made by God. As people of faith proclaim that we are all children of God and black lives matter.
Okay. Well, we welcome you on this uh, Juneteenth uh, celebration today. Uh, we want to acknowledge the fact that it is uh, hopefully going to be a national holiday. It, if you're from Texas or have roots there, you know about this um, because there's a state holiday there. Um, the story is in uh, 1865, uh, the U.S. Cavalry came into Texas to occupy. It had been held as a uh, Civil War uh, remnant up until uh, two years before the pro uh, proclamation emancipation was made. And they declared that it was um, slaves were already freed for over two years. And then it became a kind of informal celebration for African Americans in Texas. And um, I'm told that it has grown so that the whole state um, really celebrates this moment, which is just a wonderful history for us. So we celebrate it today, and we have a number of tributes uh, going on today that hopefully will enhance that particular uh, time. We also want to thank the worship team for just a wonderful, uplifting worship for us. And our youth, as usual, have been prophetic in their witness so I'm going to turn it over to um, Kathy Cap, who's going to share uh, the orders of the day, and we officially call this virtual annual conference to order. Greetings, Bishop and members of the California Pacific Annual Conference. My name is Kathy Cap, and I am your session's agenda chair. We are working through the essentials of an annual conference in a virtual world, and so we appreciate your patience. It is a compacted schedule and we will offer breaks as necessary. As participants, your cameras are not on, so if you feel antsy, feel free to stand up during the sessions. Your orders of the day for session one are as follows. And there's a second slide. So these are our orders for session one, which runs until our lunch break for Pacific Standard or Pacific Daylight Time. So Bishop, I move the orders for the day. Thanks, Kathy. Um, and well, let's uh, vote. Uh, this is a chance for you to uh, practice, but uh, because it's usually perfunctory that you accept these. Um, we're going to call for a yes vote by hand and just click that raise hand. And then we'll give you some time. And then we're going to call for a no vote. Uh, and then those uh, who wish to not Lupita, me escuchas? can vote no, and then we'll get the results, all right? So our, if you're ready, I think our tech team is ready. If you would approve okay. the agenda for today, please vote yes by raising your no. hand. No, yo, yo le sigo. Gracias, Lupita. <clears throat> and just to give you a little bit more time, we'll, we'll try to enable you to navigate this, and you'll get used to it, hopefully. Okay, I think that should do it. Now, if you do not approve, we're going to let the tech team set that up. Raise your hand if you don't approve of the uh, schedule orders for the day. And please vote now. And I have a Pueden votar ahora. come through very quickly. Creo que esto está viniendo demasiado rápido. And we'll, re we'll await the results. Vamos a esperar los resultados. 577 to 14. All right. Thank you. It has passed. So we're grateful for our technical folks who navigate that for, so well for us. I'm going to turn it over to... Um, Reverend Bob Rhodes, who's going to share opening business with us. Uh, friends, good morning. It's a privilege to be able to join you in ministry. Um, 
Uh, I have several motions as our opening motions, and so I will share these one by one. Uh, these should be uh, also enabled on the screen. Uh, so motion number one, Bishop, I move to set the bar of the 36th annual session of the California Pacific Conference to be members of the conference as specified by the discipline and the rules of the conference, as well as lay members of the Board of Ordained Ministry, the Bishop's Secretary, and such other persons as specified by the Bishop and approved by the conference, authenticated and connected through the Zoom webinar and our and or present in our broadcast location, the staff and technical crew, and the registrar and others designated by the registrar shall ensure that online participants are among those named in number one and number two previously. So Bishop, I move this full motion. Okay, can we put that first part back so people can see this? We wanna make sure, thank you, uh, that you're aware of what we are. Now it's very weird because there's no one hardly here in the sanctuary at Pasadena First, but you're all hopefully online. So once again, we're gonna do this by two votes. If you vote yes, this is the bar, uh, then you raise your hand and they'll count. Then we'll, we'll stop that and vote a second time for no. Uh, if you don't approve the bar, then you'd raise your hand then. All right, so I think we're ready. If you approve the bar, please raise your hand virtually, starting now. And we'll give you about 20 seconds for that. Les recuerdo que tienen que bajar la mano una vez que él ya ha contado los... Okay, I think you're getting the hang of this. Now, let's switch over. And if you vote no on the bar being set, and especially in this virtual capacity, please raise your hand now. Okay, we're waiting on the results. All right, uh, 652 yes, 11 no, so it clearly uh, passes. Thanks, Bob. Friends, our next motion, I move uh, that the agenda in the participant guide be the official agenda of this 36th annual session of the California Pacific Conference, and that the agenda chair and or conference secretary be authorized to make necessary adjustments in consultation with the bishop. I would note, friends, that on the screen it says 35th. That's my error. This is indeed the 36th annual session, <laughs> uh, and I move the motion in that way. I always get confused, too, so uh, it's perfectly okay, Bob. All right, it is before us. I think uh, hopefully you're getting used to this raising your hand. If you would approve this motion, please press the raise hand function, and we'll give you about 15 seconds this time. Okay, all right, now if you oppose this motion, you again will raise your hand. This is a no on that motion. Please vote now. And we'll wait on our results. Uh, 562, yes, 6, no. 562. Oh, not everybody's voting on that, but you clearly did pass that, okay? Friends, I move that the proceedings published in the UM Daily be the official minutes of this 36th, correction on the screen again, 36th annual session of the California Pacific Conference after they are corrected and approved. All right, it is before us, and... Um, I think you've gotten the instructions now. If you would vote yes on this motion, please press the raise hand now. We have a request for an extra 10 seconds to vote. Okay. We just got a request for a little bit more time. <laughs> Remember, it's on the bottom of your screen. 
but be sure to click that it, that'll come up, that'll pop up. Okay, we will give you enough time, hopefully, to navigate this. All right. Uh, we'll, we'll now take no votes on this motion. If you do not approve, raise your hand now. And we'll await our results. Uh, 400 yes, 10 no. 400 yes, 10 no. It is approved. Bishop, I move that the registrar's list of those who have signed in to the online presence shall be provided to the bishop and the conference secretary, and that this shall be considered the roll call of this 36th annual session of the California Pacific Conference. All right. So this is a, a virtual way for us to do this, and we um, are getting used to all of the nuances of this. So if you would vote yes, please raise the hand now, and we'll give you a little bit extra time. All right, if you would vote no on this, now is the time to raise the hand. Please vote now. And we'll await the results. Six sixty yes and ten no. Clearly has passed, and you're. Looks like you're getting used to this uh, raising the hand voting. Uh, the final of the opening motions, friends. I move that all resolutions not adopted by the end of this thirty-sixth annual session of the California Pacific Conference be referred to the appropriate entities. Okay. It is. Uh, pretty straightforward. If you would vote yes on this particular motion, please raise your hand virtually now. My team's asking for just a little bit more time. <laughs> 20 seconds on the last one. Uh, we've been asked a uh, request to give you a little bit more time. Okay. All right. Now, if you would vote no on this motion, once again, you'll raise the hand. Please vote now. Okay, we'll wait on the results. Okay, uh, results are in, 658 yes and 16 no. That's that concludes the opening motions, Bishop. Okay, great. Thanks, Bob. All right, we're going to turn to Wunsuk uh, to tell us uh, perhaps some announcements and information. Juan Suk, if you can join us. Right. Aloha, Bishop Hagia, all pioneering yes. siblings of Christ of the CalPAC Annual Conference. My name is Juan Suk Ya, and it is my privilege to share uh, with you announcements. We're having a little trouble with sound. Oh. We're not quite hearing you, Juan Suk. Not hearing me. Okay, Let's... now we're good. Okay, all right. Hopefully... And let me know if I need to slow down if some of you can't hear me as we are going about 3,000 miles away from each other. Uh, so my name is Wansak Ya. It is my privilege to share some of these announcements for you. And you have already heard about this technology through which we're conferencing 
um, through which we're seeing as a gift to our connectional endeavors. So thank you to the media team and the communications team, um, along with James King, who had walked us through about 11, some hilariously but seriously important information about engaging through the Zoom webinar format. So remember that we have teams that have been working on this process for some months now. And we know the process isn't perfect. We know some of you are asking more questions and, and troubleshooting along the way. But please trust us that this is the best process that we have so far. So let it work and have faith in the people who love you and the church to have made this a func as functional and smooth as possible for pretty much our 1,200 members registered and participating. So. As we continue on, I want to give you some reminders um, and some requests on behalf of the sessions team as we work hard to have a wonderful and blessed uh, conference experience together. Number one, please refer to your participant guide. Have you read it yet? Go, if you haven't, go ahead and go to calpacumc.org backslash secretary and take a read. That's where we're going to have most of our resources, and we want you to go there to get all the information you need. But if you've already read it, read it again. Most of the questions that some of you are asking us can be answered in that participant <laughs> guide. We poured a lot of love and care into that to make sure that you have the tools and the information you need to connect effectively or to reconnect and engage in the Zoom webinar format, especially if you're experiencing some technical issues. Now, I want you to look up on the screen or, well, there's only one screen that you're looking at, hopefully, but the do's and don'ts on the Q&A window. The Q&A window is to prepare to come to the mic. It's not a chat feature, though some of you are really really engaging. It's also noted, not part of the official record of our annual conference. And so in order for anything to go up, uh, it has to be recognized by the bishop at the mic. So here's some do and don'ts to help us kind of navigate that in regards to the Q&A window specifically. Um, you probably see it at the bottom of your screens or you see it on your tablet somewhere in the top left or top right corner. So do use it to come to the mic, for come to the mic procedures, if you want to speak to the body. And we'll go through the process in which um, the bishop will come to recognize you if that's, the, if that's his call. Use it to let us know about technical issues you're having. Some of you have been doing this to tell us about sound and some of the connections. We're still working on it together, but you'll know that our moderators and our tech team are working hard to assist you on this. And use it for official business of the annual conference. If you're a panel, so if you have something to add as a resource for what's been presented, that would be what you would use it for. However, please do not use it to just say hi to the bishop or the conference staff. Uh, some of you know us personally, go ahead and use your texts. Uh, use other means of social media to get to us. And also do not use it for non-conference business. I mean, you wouldn't come up to the mic just to have a side conversation with the rest of the conference. And so do not use it for that, please. Um, so if you need to come up to the mic, we have some tips that can be found again in your participant guide on page 10 to help you figure that out and how to engage in the come to mic procedure. And so as you look through your phones um, to go to your Q&A, you're going to see up, uh, you're seeing your screen, the flow chart that we have for you. Now that flow chart again is available on page 10, but when you look at that, you see the colored boxes there. We're asking you to write that in, in those boxes to say, I want to speak for, or I want to speak against, I want to make a point of order or privilege, I have a question, I want to make an amendment, or I want to make a motion. Type that into the Q&A for us to know what it's about. And as you've been asking about technical things, go ahead and add that in too. But if you want to come up to the mic, we're asking you to fill out your Q&A in that way. Remember James King's webinar demonstration? Do it just like he did. And if you have any questions or if you have, if you missed it, you can go back to the annual conference website and they have the video of him giving the demonstration. You can take a look at that during your lunch break. But depending on the subject matter, a moderator will assist you uh, depending on the legislation, voting or other technical matters. Now, when the bishop does call on you, you're gonna see this part. Uh, I want you to see this come to the mic slide. Remember as the moderators unmute you, Remember, remember, remember to say first your name, then whether you're clergy or lady, and then the church or agency that you represent. So just to demonstrate, my name is Wansuk Ya. I am clergy 
from Kahalu'u United Methodist Church. We're just asking you to do that and then continue on as you're called by the bishop to speak. Now we've been getting some questions about virtual booths and our recommendation is to log on early. You see some of the slides come up and you see some of uh, the announcements. Our pre-session slideshow is filled with that information for the different ministries and updates. And so they're like the booths that for some of you are familiar with that annual conference, like what's over on the field, okay? And I want to offer you another friendly reminder. Do not log out of Zoom during the short breaks that we have in the plenary. Just stay logged in for about 15 minutes. Make sure your iPad, your phone, whatever laptop you're using is plugged in. And then you can log out after the plenary is over. So the next time that we're logging out, for those of us in Pacific Daylight Time, that's our 1 p.m. lunch break. For those of us in Hawaii, it's at 10 a.m. for our breakfast time. And for those of us in Guam and Saipan, that's 6 a.m. And as usual, we encourage you to try to log back in starting about 30 minutes before the scheduled plenary times. We want to make sure you have ample amount of time just in case you're experiencing some logging in and technical difficulties. Now, for the rest of the updates on legislation and the UM dailies, make sure to check out the conference secretary page at calpacumc.org backslash secretary. Keep going back to that site. We are hoping that would be your one-stop shop for the rest of annual conference for all the information and legislation that you need, including uh, whatever updates that we have. Again, we thank you for your generous patience and your grace as we navigate together through this technological frontier. Thank you and mahalo. Thank you, Wong Suk. Okay, we are grateful for all of the people that have made this possible. We'll give a full thanks uh, at the end of our time. We're also learning a whole lot about being online a lot. Um, I uh, had to take in the council bishops meeting virtually, and it was a literally uh, a three-day event, and it's really tough on you to stay uh, focused and attentive for over that long a period. So hopefully we built in breaks that really will help you um, navigate this and stay with us. Um, so uh, in order to um, really appreciate this kind of historic time, uh, we wanted to do um, another tribute to George Floyd and to the others who've also passed away or been killed, really. Armand Arbery, um, Breonna Taylor, Richard Brooks. And we were going to do the 8 minute 46 seconds, but our youth did that for us already. So I would like to, to do with you a litany that the Council of Bishops has provided. And this litany is going to be played um, nationally soon. You could probably get the whole thing where they had taped various um, annual conferences in this litany. So if we could put this up now, I'll have our tech team. We're going to do the first part of the litany. All right, there it is. And what I'd like to invite you, wherever you are, is to say the verses of the Kyrie. So when it comes up, first verse of the Kyrie, just recite it by yourself, um, and you'll be joining with all of those that are online. And we'll, it'll be self-explanatory how this goes. Beloved, come to the table, come to this annual conference of the Lord with hearts open to repentance, confession, and change. There are no words that can contain the depth of sorrow, grief, and pain that mothers, sons, and all exclaim, Kyrie eleison. Holy God, we come before you with hearts full of pain and our bones crushed by the weight of sin. We come in confession and repentance. Lord, have mercy, Kyrie eleison. It is enough the prophets cry, yet still black men are doomed to die by those who wish to vilify. Kyrie eleison. It is enough. The harm must cease from warring madness by police who are sworn to protect, keep peace. Kyrie eleison. 
for the comfort we have secured with our silence, for our lack of action in the face of racism, white supremacy, and privilege. We come in confession and repentance. Lord, have mercy. Kyrie eleison. It is enough. We cannot wait. No more excuses for bias, hate. Your savagery we cannot take. Christie eleison. For our refusal to move from acts of mercy to acts of justice, for our refusal to engage the discomfort of biblical obedience, for our refusal to name and dismantle personal and institutional racism, we come in confession and repentance. Lord, have mercy. Kyrie eleison. It is enough. We cannot breathe. Will you stand there and watch us bleed? Are you not moved by cries and pleas? Christie eleison. For creating and sustaining a system that places its value in counting numbers, for the hypocrisy of touting our creeds and claiming our diversity while continuing to be a church that is 93% white. We come in confession and repentance. Lord, have mercy. Curie eleison. O oh, my soul, it aches and yearns for a day when passions burn, for others with deep love concern. Curie eleison. For the abandonment of our cities and urban centers, leaving congregations of black and brown people to deal with massive debt and crumbling church buildings. For the duplicity and dishonesty of holding congregations of people of color accountable for self-sustainability, even as their communities choke on minimum wages, we come in confession and repentance. Lord, have mercy. Christie eleison. I've had enough of these charades, of cliches and hasty crusades, whose triteness wounds and cuts like blades, Kyrie eleison. For our insidious and endless theological debates, while people of color are dehumanized by racist policing, profiling, discrimination, and transphobia, we come in confession and repentance, Lord, have mercy, Kyrie eleison. There are no words that contain the depth of our wounds of our soul sustain. Each time a grieving heart exclaims, Curie eleison. For our failure to be an obedient church, for not having done your will, for breaking your law and rebelling against your love, for not loving our neighbors and not hearing the cry of the needy, forgive us, we pray. Free us from joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And I think that that concludes. So let us hear the words of pardon and assurance that God forgives us as sinful and as uh, wrong-headed as we humans can be, that God continues to love and embrace us and hopes for better hopes that we do better, hopes that we all can come together and be a better community. So we're thankful for this time, and we will have more tributes coming up to Black Lives Matter, to George Floyd and those that have died, and uh, for this Juneteenth uh, time together. All right, I'm going to turn it back to Reverend Rhodes for uh, rules change Friends, as motion. We are, uh, engaging in this virtual uh, conference session, um, we thought it might be prudent to uh, uh, add a rule uh, related to this. This rule was submitted to the Rules Committee, and it's important to note that the Rules Committee did not reach a consensus on a recommendation related to this rule. Um, if you would like to find this rule, it's on page 88 of your preliminary report. It is fairly short, so I will read it to you. It adds rule VC9, which reads in this way, 
Should unexpected circumstances prevent physical gathering for an annual session, the session's task force under the direction of the bishop may establish technical slash virtual means to gather and to carry out the business of the annual conference. This must include methods to experience worship, participate in debate, including ways to perfect legislation and vote. Security measures must be included to ensure the integrity of voting. Bishop, I move rules item 20-01. Okay, this is before you as a body. Um, the Council of Bishops has taken this up, and as a group we agreed that this uh, is necessitated by the fact that we cannot physically gather. It's just not safe to have all of you in one confined place like uh, Redlands, for example. So um, it's not the best circumstances, but we found nothing in the Book of Discipline that could prohibit uh, virtual annual conferences but we did want to make sure that we have this rule change for all of the conferences who are going to do this. And there, uh, I think um, about half of the conferences are going to actually do this uh, procedure. Some are waiting until um, protocols are lifted and see if they can physically meet. But if they can't, then they're going to go to virtual also. All right. So, um, we're going to uh, tweak this a little bit. I've, I've been told that this will help our counters and our tech folks. If you would vote for this motion, please click the raise your hand now, and then I'm going to ask you to lower. We have this as a poll. We have this as a oh, you do have it as a poll. Okay, very good. All right, I'm sorry. There's a poll that will come up. Okay, there it is. Bob, anything that you, on this? If you are in favor, click in favor. If you are opposed, click opposed. Please vote now. And we'll give you a little extra time because this is your first poll that has come up. Okay, I think we're in good shape there, and um, we'll get the results. Okay, 99%, you're pretty much all in favor, so uh, appreciate that. Any other items um, at this time, Bob? Can I just verify uh, your ruling of law? Go ahead. Uh, friends, as your conference secretary, uh, it is important to share when uh, uh, the bishop issues a ruling of law. Uh, Reverend Richard Bentley uh, requested a decision of law related to joint charge conferences, membership, and voting in the joint charge conference and the agenda. Um, bishop Hagia released his decision of law on June 19th, 2020, uh, and this will be forwarded to the Judicial Council for review. Uh, and so this is uh, a sort of a point of information um, uh, that this will be... Uh, Moving on to the Judicial Council. Okay, thank you, Bob. And I think uh, we're about due for our delegation pre record. Is that where we are? Yes. So we'll have our tech team uh, do a pre recording of our delegation, and we want to thank all of them for the hard work they put in uh, for this virtual annual conference. Here it is. The listening posts were designed to first build a sense of community and shared identity. As multiple churches were included in each one, not everyone knew each other, and it was important to establish this commonality before progressing, particularly when different theological viewpoints were represented. There were then a series of guided questions designed to walk through the process of naming and identifying problems before coming up with visions for a new way forward and ways in which those visions could be achieved. The attendees were split into small groups for many of the discussions and invited to share a summary with the larger group as they were comfortable. Each post had a facilitator and a recorder who summarized the conversation directly onto a form which matched the format of the questions being discussed. These forms were then collated and mined and used to form the body of this report. While there was a good response to the listening posts, 
there were several obstacles which made the process more challenging and reduced the possible engagement and attendance, particularly with laity. There were a few churches which did not respond or declined the request to host. Similarly, there were a number of clergy who did not respond or declined the request to facilitate. Where clergy did not share the information with their membership about the listening posts, then the information was not received by those who were targeted. A better system for contacting the laity directly needs to be implemented in order to overcome this for future events. A number of lessons were learned regarding staging, facilitation, and communication, which will be addressed before the next round is launched. A few complaints were received as to the structure and perceived bias of the listening posts. These complaints came from those who had a different theological viewpoint to the majority of the people who were in attendance and came from both dominant stances. The full report detailing the findings can be found in the preliminary report. In summary, people were able to find areas where their shared experiences in being a part of a United Methodist Church community gave them more in common than not. Many felt that the decisions being made by the global church were impacting the local church community now more than ever before and did not reflect their own community well. Regardless of where the participants stood on the results of General Conference 2019, there was a commonality in the expression of problems felt within the global United Methodist Church, which were impacting local churches in a detrimental way. Many of the newly imagined churches were those who went out into the local community and found ways of addressing the needs they found there. The desire for a flatter structure to our global church was also expressed. Requirements for a more effective method of communication were shared, as were more opportunities for roundtable discussions, shared worship, and ministry. As a result, the following path forward was recommended. A better method for communicating with and engaging all of the laity is needed. It's very clear that the local churches do not feel they are adequately equipped and require more training, particularly on homosexuality and the Bible and opportunities for conversations. In addition, training and resources need to be made available on having difficult conversations. There is a clear minority who do not want to see any changes to the current legislation and are frustrated with the conference position. Conversations and relationships with these minority groups are a vital component to moving forward as a conference. Local churches want to focus on mission and ministry to all and require an organizational structure which better equips them for this and whose global positions do not affect them directly. They also want to be more engaged with other churches in their area. Mission and district area events to address this would assist in addition to a resource person at annual conference level who could help them with inclusion and cultural competency. In August 2019, Bishop Grant sent out a message to every local church requesting they complete an additional form at their charge conferences. Bishop Grant's message explained the purpose of these forms was as follows. Each of our California Pacific Annual Conference local churches take time to vision what their church will look like to their own congregation, their neighborhood, and community. Under the tagline, I see a new church, what will your church look like and embody in your local community? This is a chance for all of us to participate in the fresh wind from God that is flowing for our whole United Methodist denomination. Bishop Grant posed a few questions to help guide the completion of these forms. What central mission and purpose is your church called to at this time? What is the central need of your neighborhood and surrounding community? How can your church fulfill its purpose in making disciples for the transformation of the world. What compelling missional message would relate to the non-churched people living in your community? Who is God calling your church to be? 
These are just a few of the many questions that can be used to create a response to the vision of I see a new church. Answering this question dovetails with the new emergence of the church that we started this reflection with. It allows us to participate in the fresh wind of the spirit that will come no matter what obstacles we put in its way. The district superintendents gathered the responses of these forms and from that a summary was produced. This can be seen in detail in the preliminary report. A total of 127 completed forms were received. 61% of these explicitly expressed a vision of a church where all were included as full and active members. 8% stated full support of the legislation passed at General Conference 2019. 35% made no mention of LGBTQIA plus inclusion or exclusion at all. Some churches reflected a lack of consensus in their church and a need to explore the conversation in greater detail. Many of the statements provided visions of a church which would reach further into the community in which they are located, reaching out to explore the needs of that community and finding ways to address those needs through their own resources all displayed a willingness to learn and grow. In response to the bishop's initial framing questions, the following summarizes the answers received across the conference. We are a justice-centered conference, and this is clear in the statements received. More than 75% of statements included working toward equity for everyone and specifically marginalized communities such as ethnic minorities, unhoused, and families at risk. A significant number wanted the opportunity to concentrate on mission and ministry in their local setting, not focusing on the machinations of the global church. 30 of the 127 responses received talked specifically about the change they saw coming to their local churches. Each of these explained how they were going to be looking at the local community for guidance on the best way for their church to meet the local needs. Some mentioned specific age groups, such as youth or seniors, while others envisage learning about the community more before deciding on specific ministries. As communities around our churches shift and change, there is a need to re-examine who our neighbors are, what needs of theirs can be addressed by the church, and how the local church can be effective in ministry and welcome to these communities in order to bring the gospel to as many as possible. This survey was open to anyone in the California Pacific Annual Conference between December 12, 2019 and January 26th of this year. Results were collected online and through a printed survey distributed at listening posts and by local churches. 2,096 people participated from all five districts. When asked to choose five of the most important things to our Christian faith, there were some things we all agreed on. A belief in Jesus, worship, prayer, fellowship, feeding the hungry, serving the poor, and clothing the naked, our local churches, and spiritual formation. Across our diversity, we lifted up the Wesleyan understanding of grace as one of the most important parts of our Methodist life. Also receiving frequent mention were UMCOR, our social principles, social holiness, connectionalism, cultural and denominational traditions, and our Methodist doctrine. The survey revealed widespread agreement that we are accepting of LGBTQIA members in our churches, 96.8% of respondents. Of those, 89.8% indicated that they were willing and comfortable with such inclusion. However, while this value for inclusion is shared by a clear majority of our conference, there is significant variation visible when responses are sorted for ethnicity. Across all ethnicities, a majority of people affirmed a willingness to accept LGBTQIA persons as members of our churches. There was more resistance visible to accepting LGBTQIA persons in various leadership roles, such as lay leaders, Sunday school volunteers and pastors. 
More than three-fourths of the survey's responses indicated willingness to support same-gender weddings in our churches. More than two-thirds of those said they were willing and comfortable with same-gender weddings. Again, however, responses varied when broken out by ethnicity. Our survey asked a set of questions that became more difficult to interpret after the release of the proposed Protocol for Reconciliation and Grace Through Separation. Because survey responses were submitted both before and after the details of the protocol were shared, there's confusion in the implication of various strategies we'd laid out, making it difficult to draw clear conclusions from the data. Overall, respondents indicated a lack of support for both the traditional plan and for dissolution of the UMC when asked to rate their support on a one to five scale. The survey also indicates majority, 59%, support for disaffiliation from the UMC and more than two thirds, 69%, support for efforts to stay and resist. Across all differences of opinion, respondents consistently placed very high value on their connection to the local church with an average of 4.6 on a one to five scale. This is consistent with our denominational description that the local church is the primary area in which our disciple making mission is lived out. Following all the results from the listening post, I see a new church, and the delegation survey, we would like to leave you with a question to ponder. As our world has shifted following the coronavirus pandemic, how has the vision for your church altered? What changes would you make in your vision of I see a new church now? This is not the annual conference any of us was expecting. In these days of pandemic and physical separation of masks and hand wipes, of questions and anxiety, the struggles of our family fight may seem petty. Not because full inclusion of all God's people in the family of God is petty, but because to be wrestling over it amidst a world where we are reminded that disease and disaster do not choose their victims along theological, racial, economic or other human divisions seems petty. Such crises do, however, reveal the disparities and the injustices that are caused by such divisions. With the most vulnerable, the most oppressed, the most at risk suffering the most. If we have eyes to see, these days have revealed the critical work to which we are called as Christ's disciples. Here in the California Pacific, we are the world. We have been given the great opportunity by God in our vast diversity to witness to Jesus's prayer that his followers might be one in loving the world as we have been loved. Now is the time to claim our theological foundation and our guiding values. Members of the delegation and conference leadership team have prepared the following video to lay out a vision for who we are as an annual conference to what God has called us to witness and to guide our decisions about how we will live and serve together, regardless of what happens in the larger denomination. At the end of this video, a few questions will be posed, which will be before us in the coming months. Opportunities will be provided for us to consider the new things we are being called to, as well as to grapple with the challenges and blessings of our diversity. We look forward to receiving your input, your questions, and your comments. You can send them to GC2020 at calpacumc.org so we can continue the conversation. The California Pacific Conference covers the Southern California landscape from the high Sierras of Bishop south through the Antelope Valley into the Inland Empire of the San Bernardino region, out into the desert of Palm Springs, reaching through the Imperial Valley to the Arizona border. It runs the coast from Estero Bay to San Diego along the Pacific Ocean, encompassing the vast cities in Los Angeles and Orange Counties. We reach thousands of miles across the Pacific to the islands of Hawaii, Saipan, and Guam. Yes, Kalpak is a place of wide variations between mountains and deserts, valleys and coastline, rural towns, and dense urban megacities. 
The people within the boundaries of this conference are as diverse as the physical landscape that makes up our home. Demographic studies reveal that in California, 43% of us identify as Hispanic, Latino, 36% white, 12% Asian, 6% African American, black, and 3% Pacific Islander, Native American, and people not otherwise identified. In Hawaii, statistics estimate that 37% of us identify as Asian, 22% white, 19% as multiracial, 10.5% Hispanic, 9.5% as Pacific Islander or Native Hawaiian, and 2% as African American black and people not otherwise identified. Amidst this vast, diverse array of God's creation, the people called Methodists are called to live out Jesus' new command to love one another just as Jesus has loved us. While this region is known for its diversity, we do not know our diversity. We live among each other, but often not with one another. Christ's claim on our lives compels us to a different way of being. We are called to build relationships of respect, mutuality, and grace, seeking to embody Christ's love for us as we love one another. Here, John Wesley's sermon on the Catholic spirit is helpful. He commends, if your heart is as my heart, if you love God and all humankind, I ask no more, give me your hand. Rooted in this spirit, in the midst of our broad diversity, we can share God's love with others. The people in our communities, beyond our doors, outside our comfort zones, as we unite in faith and mission. In 2012, a survey of people in this region asked whether God is love and invites the world into a loving relationship. An average of 63.3% said yes. But by 2017, that same survey revealed that only 52.6% people still thought those things true. In just five years, God lost ground, significant ground, almost an 11% drop in those who felt God yearned to love them. Could our mission then be clearer? Our priorities more evident at the heart of our calling in our particular context of ministry is a reality that people need to experience that God is love and longs to be in a loving, affirming, and welcoming relationship with them. God has placed us amidst a context of great diversity, ourselves a people of great diversity, for a purpose, and that is to witness to this radical embrace of God we need each other to do this well and with integrity. For as Paul wrote to the people of Corinth, for just as the body is one and has many members and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free. And we were all made to drink of one spirit. At Christ's invitation then, the California Pacific Conference will live and work together at one table with room for all, thus reflecting the God-given diversity of our conference and affirming the call to be in communion with all of God's beloved children. Though we differ and disagree, we will not condemn each other for our differences. We will seek to live and minister together with love and grace, in tension with our beliefs, but not in rejection of one another. Therefore, we affirm and pledge the following, the power of God's love and grace to create and uphold an open, affirming and inclusive church in which all God's beloved children are welcomed and embraced. The new church as a vibrant, loving community in which differences of any kind, race, ethnicity, language, culture, sexual identity, gender, ability, nationality, are affirmed as manifestations of God's abundant and holy creation. 
Making Disciples for the Transformation of the World is an endeavor done best through welcoming, encouraging, recognizing, and utilizing all of the varieties of expressions and gifts and resources that the Spirit has given us to live out the good news of Jesus the Christ. A faithful church in which the sacraments of baptism and Holy Communion, as well as confirmation, ordination, marriage, servant ministries, mission work, and leadership at every level, are open to all who are called by God and affirmed by the Church, as witnessed by our risen Savior and Lord. The Historic Doctrine and Wesleyan Ecclesiology of the United Methodist Church, rooted and grounded in the Trinity, in which accountability is marked by covenant and grace. A theological task which requires the engagement of Scripture as encountered through the lens of tradition, experience, and reason, which allows for a breadth of faithful understandings. A church born of the living word of God, open to the leading of the Holy Spirit through scholarship and life itself. A connection of church in vital mission to and with the world for the transformation of the church and the world, partnering with the Holy Spirit to bring forth justice, equity, peace, and vibrant health for the whole of the creation. Beloved, as we give ourselves to Christ, we are freed to accept each other and live with our differences. Therefore, let us commit ourselves to welcoming and receiving all people to Christ's communion table and to the full life and leadership of the church. Let us sit together, embracing our theological diversity loving each other wholly and rejecting none personally. Let us stand firmly within the best of our Wesleyan tradition to witness to the wideness of God's grace in a broken world in need of Christ's healing, liberating love. We would like to invite you now to begin to reflect on what you have heard in this video by considering the following questions. What does the theology of one table mean to you? Where have you been welcomed at a table? What difference did it make? How does God's grace enable you to welcome those beyond your comfort zones? What resonates with you about this statement? Let us sit together embracing our theological diversity, loving each other wholly, and rejecting none personally. We appreciate your time, your input, and your thoughtful reflection. God bless us all as we commit ourselves to the ministry of Jesus Christ. Amen. with the questions and then come back. Once again, as uh, Wonsuk had said, don't log out because it'll take you longer to get back in. Uh, why don't we try to shoot for 10 minutes on a, a short break and then we'll rejoin in, after 10 minutes. Thank you very much and have a, a really quick break. Okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah. I've
Okay, welcome back. Uh, we have a quick announcement from our host pastor, uh, Reverend Sandy Olwine, who will share just a, a quick uh, announcement to you. And we are thankful for Sandy and the hospitality at Pastina First. Sandy? Thank you, Bishop. It is a great honor for us to be able to, to host the part of the, the service, uh, the annual conference that is live uh, here in the sanctuary and uh, having people um, working in different rooms in our facility. We would ask if you are not giving a presentation, uh, if you are not assigned to a, a role though, that you would refrain from just dropping by the church. Um, it's, a, it's hard to say no to you, but we would ask that uh, we have trying to do no harm and to protect people's health. And we'd like to ask uh, only those persons who are specifically supposed to be here to please come and the rest of you uh, be with us in spirit and not in body. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, I think we're going to hear from our uh, laity, and so this is a pre-recorded session, so our, our tech folks can put that up. We'll uh, roll our laity address. This is not the annual conference any of us was expecting. As in these California days of pandemic and physical separation, of mask and hand wipes, of questions for and anxieties, during the struggle. This is our last annual conference as the California Pacific Conference Co-Lay Leaders, a position we have held for eight years. During that time, we were blessed to have outstanding support from our resident bishops, the annual conference staff, and the district lay leaders. We are extremely grateful and we thank them all. We are now living in times more difficult than we can remember. Times that are nearly impossible to comprehend. Times that are normal. Times that create unusual anxiety. Times when the roles of church leaders are more critical. And times that only God can resolve. Nevertheless, the work of the California Pacific continues. The Conference Lady Council, which we lead, consists of the district lay leaders and some associate lay leaders from each of the conference districts, as well as the Director of Lay Servant Ministry and representatives from the United Methodist Women, United Methodist Men, and our youth. We normally meet quarterly and have done so until the government's recent directive that no groups of more than 10 can meet together. Consequently, our retreat on February 1st was the last in-person gathering that was held. At that time, <clears throat> we met at Northridge United Methodist Church and were blessed to have our Bishop and Reverend Denise Barnes join us. Bishop Hagia spoke to us about the issues facing the United Methodist denomination and spent time responding to the many questions that were asked. Reverend Barnes spoke to us about what more can we do to welcome our LGBTQ brothers and sisters to our churches. It was really an interesting retreat. None of us could have imagined that it would be our last in-person meeting during the 2019-2020 conference year, but it was, and we are now in the midst of a deadly coronavirus pandemic. It is now our privilege to share with you the following abbreviated reports from our district lay leaders and the director of the Lay Servant Ministry. From the East District, Diane Jim and Annie Solomon co leaders. The general mission and purpose of the East District churches at this time is to proclaim God's endless grace for all people, to practice in, 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 intentional discipleship, which allows all people to grow, learn, and become children of God. This was accomplished through training, workshops, conferencing, hospitality activities, marketing strategies, and effective outreach projects in the surrounding neighborhoods. Their intention was to remind them that God's love 
is the miraculous healing force that tears down the wall that divides us. The outreach projects were the keys in getting the message to the masses. They played a key role in addressing the non-church, neighborhoods, and surrounding community needs. God is calling each one of us to be the church. Follow his teaching. The Hawaii District, as reported by Lynn Owen, who is the former district lay leader, indicated the central mission of the churches is to spread God's love as followers of Jesus Christ to all people through worship, through Christian action, through our lives, through helping address the homeless population, through strengthening relationships and understanding between diverse cultures, through teaching and preaching life-changing scripture from God's word so that the person recognizes that he or she has a purpose and impact on their friends, their families, and their communities, answering their questions of unbelief, offering more flexibility in the worship setting, welcoming all people, and offering them a place to feel that they are a part of God's family and answering God's call to be the new church, one church in the spirit of unity. From the North District, May Maka and J.P. Harris, co leaders <clears throat> We are happy to report that the North District is doing ministry in a new and mighty way. We had two leadership training workshops since the district is too big for one. We had the first leadership training at Northridge United Methodist Church on January 25th and on February 29th at Royal Grande United Methodist Church. <clears throat> The North District members experienced an amazing and spiritual worship service. We also offered a variety of workshops like I See a New Church, a Sharing Your Faith Story, Small Group Workshop, and Discipleship Systems. The North District had completed all their charge conferences and they had donated more than $17,000 for Ministry Against tra Human Trafficking. The North District holds our prayer for all of our churches, especially especially during these difficult times. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The South District as headed by Dion Taylor, the uh, district lay leader indicated, our churches are prayerfully engaged for our church, our families, our friends, our neighbors, our country and our world as we practice social distancing and shelter in place as the response to the coronavirus pandemic. It is an adjustment to participate in worship via live streaming, but the presence of God is evident even in these unprecedented times. Each United Methodist Church pastor and local church lay leader is aware of the potential for feelings of uncertainty and isolation that is experienced by our church family. As such, United Methodist churches throughout the South District are vigilantly working to meet the needs of church and community members through their expressions of love and concern. The Holy Spirit is working through them as they become the hands and feet of Christ for everyone who misses the in-person worship in the sanctuary. As district lay leader, I emailed all of the local lay leaders conveying a message from our Bishop Hagia with information comparing the multiple proposals, including the proposal of reconciliation and grace through separation that were going to be discussed and voted upon at General Conference this year. However, as you know, General Conference has been postponed due the, to the COVID-19 pandemic. In the West District, where J. Andre Aldrich and Mercy Hurstead are the co-lay leaders. In the West District are 85 plus churches and 13 missionaries have been blessed with diverse and committed leadership which begins with our district superintendent, Reverend Mark Nakagawa. 
and flows down to all of our clergy and laity. Reverend Mark has a passion for helping God's people. To him, all really means all. We are all called to study God's word and be inclusive as we are called to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of this world and experience God's love. The district strives to implement CalPAC's goal of planting and growing new churches by inspiring the world as passionate followers of Jesus Christ so that all can experience God's life-giving love. As we continue our work, we agree that there are core values that we live on in our jurisdiction, and the most important is that all are welcome in the house of God, and no one, no one should be excluded from the love of God. Our district continues implementing our conference's transformation objective, Christian leadership, discipleship making, vital congregations. As co-leaders of the World West District, we are amazed at the good works being performed around the district that honors our God, benefits our communities, and upholds our annual conference. The following are a few of the highlights are 13 mission areas, district leadership training workshops, safe parking lots and ride homes, resurgence creative lab in neighborhood church centers, hosting safe visitation sites for LA court ordered parental supervised visitations for children, Lay Surrent School, United Methodist Living into the Future Foundation, Kid City Program, UCLA Cafe Program, and the West District Union. Their mission, to continue to work to provide a sign of God's love in seeking peace, justice, and freedom for all those we serve. We shall continue to work to alleviate human suffering in all forms within our district and beyond as we strive to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. The Lay Servant Ministries, headed by Howard Fallman, reported that last year, the two consistent themes raised in the Lay Servant and Certified Lay Minister Annual Reports are more educational and training opportunities and better communication. These issues will continue to be challenges for the Lay Servant Ministry directors. However, as a committee, our goals for the past year were number one, to improve the web page and the ability to communicate more directly with lay servants and certified lay ministers. Number two, to develop a uniform class registration form. Number three, to improve <clears throat> the annual report form. Number four, to better communicate where and when classes are being offered. Number five, to facilitate the ability of lay servants to communicate between and among themselves. Number six, to clearly communicate the three certified lay servant roles. They are certified lay servant, certified lay speaker, certified lay minister. Through the efforts of our conference staff, we have made great strides in accomplishing those goals. Using the conference database as our central tool for class registration and for annual reports, we now have searchable information readily available. We give thanks to the following conference staff for their guidance. Darren Arnson, Associate Director of Vocational Discernment and Call. Jennifer Gaylord, Database Manager. James Kang, Director of Communications and Innovation, and Maya Kim, Communications Assistant. We also appreciate the assistance of our district directors. They are Grace Layton and Reverend Garth Gilliam from the North District, Pam Cherness and Susan Naslin from the South District, Melody and Paul Ashley from the West District, Pat Hogan and Susan Ross from the East District, and Winifred Cheng from the Hawaii District. Let us be filled with the Spirit 
as we go forward together with the assurance and confidence of God being with us always. As we end this report, Phil and I would like to pray. Gracious and loving Father, thank you for giving us another day to serve you. Thank you for always guiding us in our work with the conference and our churches. Thank you that in spite of the pandemic we are experiencing, you still arrange for us to have our annual conference. But most of all, Father, thank you for your love and constant presence in our lives. We pray with confidence, assurance, and gratitude in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We want to thank Phil and Connie and their entire team of district lay leaders. It's been a marvelous time for me to work with all of them, and especially Phil and Connie. Uh, before I was elected, uh, we had both of them as our district lay leaders, and it was such a delight to come back to um, lead a conference where they're in leadership. Um, the unfortunate thing is that this time around, we're not able to do our uh, bishops awards of which both of them are recipients but what we're going to do is um, have next year physical annual conference include this year's class of bishop awardees as well as the following the next year's class so they'll be a bit longer but it'll be a chance for us to fully recognize them which they need to we need to do in a, a large gathering like we usually have so let us uh, thank Phil and Connie and all of our lay leaders who have served so well, and some of them will be back with us, and others will be in other leadership capacities. So thank you, thank you. I um, wanted just to do a quick um, uh, item before we put on the next video with uh, President Kwan, and that is that um, with COVID-19, uh, general conference and jurisdictional conference has been postponed and there will be no new general conference in 2021. It's the postponed 2020 general conference. So with that, all of our delegates that we are duly elected are simply um, carrying on their duties. There's no need for another election. There's no need for an affirmation of them. They have been duly elected. So we want to just uh, remind the body of that fact and to remember the, to keep in prayer with all of them as we go into the next round and hopefully physically can meet um, in 2021, okay? I think we're ready for our uh, video with uh, Claremont School of Theology and President Jeffrey Kwan. Greetings to the annual conferences of the Great Western Jurisdiction. I'm Jeffrey Kwan, President of Claremont School of Theology. I'm grateful for this opportunity to speak to you in these most unusual circumstances. I bring you greetings and share some significant achievements CSD has accomplished over the last year, in spite of the global pandemic. First, with the help of alumnus and Board of Trustees member, the Reverend Steve Horsfield Johnston, a beautiful and inspiring short film about the spirit of CSD, our preparedness for a changing world, and our move to Salem was created. As most of you know by now, CSD has begun relocating to Salem, Oregon. So please hear Professor Merita and pioneer in process theology, Dr. Marjorie Suhoki's reflection on CSD's move. Fairmont School of Theology has a history of reinventing itself. I mean, that's a part of its DNA. It began in the Valley as the McClay College, Bible College. 
From there, it moved to Los Angeles, of all places, from the valley, rural, to an urban setting. And it becomes part of the Department of Religion at the University of Southern California. Then, in the 1950s, there's an opportunity to move. And so they go to Claremont and they find Pump Caldwell, who is a legendary educator, to lead the school. And so it becomes the School of Theology at Claremont, which eventually became Claremont School of Theology. Once again, it's moving to Willamette University in Salem, Oregon. And I can hardly wait to see what Claremont does as Claremont School of Theology at Willamette. Indeed, CSD has a history of reinventing itself. In, pre in preparation for the move, we have been digging into and organizing our archives and what I know now for sure is that our seminary is and always has been resilient, progressive, and a leading voice in innovative theological education. The short film, which can be seen in its entirety on our YouTube channel, helps to tell CSD's story. And you can find the link in our conference report. In the meantime, please know we are still your seminary and we are ready for whatever the pandemic has in store for the remainder of 2020. Our incredible professors have been teaching online for nearly 10 years. And so when the world was hit with COVID-19, they were ready to pivot with the least amount of disruption to our students. Our hybrid online programs make theological degrees possible while students are nurtured and formed within their own contexts. Today, our admissions team has not slowed recruiting and our professors are preparing to teach in whatever format come fall. In a similar vein, our advancement and communications team put together a memory book titled CSD, Yesterday, Today and Tomorrow. While not a complete history of CSD, the book shares snippets of the school dating back to 1885 and includes links to some of CSD's video and film archives. Most importantly, it encourages readers to interact with its pages by adding their own memories and mementos. Please visit our website to order your copy. Believing our relationship to you and to our alumni, alumni, students and future students are vitally important to us. We partnered with a company in Houston to conduct comprehensive alumni, students and friends survey. This was a huge undertaking, but we are learning so much. We conducted focus groups, heard from more than 400 of our constituents through the survey, and we are beginning to engage folks in the strategic use of the results to further build and strengthen relationships across the Western jurisdiction. Like many of you, because of the pandemic, there were many flat plans that had to be postponed. We were to celebrate the final commencement in Claremont with our largest class of graduates in the school's history. We were to have a day for alumni, alumni and friends to reflect, remember and celebrate all that CSD and the Claremont campus meant to them. And we were to have workshops and an inter-religious panel discussion to give folks in the Pacific Northwest a taste of Claremont. We do still hope for to offer some version of all of these in the fall. So please wash your inboxes for invitations. In closing, I leave you with the words of faith and vision from our Chair of the Board of Trustees and UMC clergy person, the Reverend Patricia Ferris. We can choose to understand and see change as a gift from God. We can choose to see God at work in this. 
we can see God animating our dreams and our deepest hopes. And when we do that, then we can put our confidence in God, even if we still have some questions and some things that we're wondering about as all this goes forward. We know that the Claremont commitment to preparing leadership for the church, laity and clergy in many forms will continue. Thank you again for taking the time to watch this video. And we look with you to our future. We look in hope and in confidence of God's leading. And we are grateful for your prayers and presence in the journey. Together, we are CSD. And uh, grateful for President Kwan for his wonderful uh, affirmation of the School of Theology, of which is our seminary, really. And that won't change with any move. So we are thankful for his gifts of leadership, and especially our own uh, Patricia Ferris, who uh, chairs our board, as many of our board members are uh, CalPAC members. Uh, we now turn to Reverend Leah Booth, who will share with us our legislation process, and um, thank you for attention. Leah? Good afternoon, Bishop and members, members of the annual conference. We'll begin our legislation for this session with Recommendation 20 TAC 2 which you can find on page 69 of the preliminary report. This is pensions item one, health care for active clergy and families and lay employees. Bishop, I move recommendation 20-02. It is before us and I, I'm told there's a poll on this. All righty. So we will have you look for the poll and it makes it a little bit easier when we do this. Um, See if we can get this up. Ah, oh, there it is. Okay, so if you would do um, your vote on recommendation 2002, uh, please vote in favor or opposed, and please vote now. Okay. I'm told that there's a slight delay in the Hawaii uh, transmission, and that's a long ways, <laughs> as you all know. <laughs> so it's understandable. So we're going to give them a little bit more time to uh, vote on this one. Be sure to hit submit after you've placed your vote. Any word from our tech team? Are we okay to close this? Uh, let's give it a, little more. a little bit more time. We're getting instructions over directly from them. All of our tech folks, by the way, there is uh, Pasadena folks who are doing all the filming and um, uh, video and audio for us here, but we have a whole tech team at the conference center who are working diligently to get everything coordinated. So we want to thank them for all of the work they're doing. How are we doing? Um, so the, the, the people who were in this panel were not set as able to vote. So my recommendation is to let's stop this, let's oh, change this so the panelists can vote and let's vote again. But I would say what I'm going to do is qualify this vote and want to. Okay. Okay, I've been told that the panelists uh, have been sort of locked out of this vote. So why don't we do this? Let's start over again, and we'll launch it again. Leah, one more time, just go, go through the first one, and we'll launch the poll. So our first piece of legislation is Recommendation 2002. You can find that recommendation on page 69 of the preliminary report. It's pensions item 1. Health care for active clergy and families and lay employees. Bishop, I move recommendation 2002. Thanks, Leah. Good practice. <laughs> okay. All right. Now it is directly before us. I hope we've worked out the technical difficulty of having everybody be able to vote on this. Uh, the poll will come up. Bishop, we're going to need about two minutes. 
two minutes. Okay. All right. We having a little bit of technical difficulties. I apologize to all of you, but you know that、um, as we kind of explained、uh, earlier, whenever you're in a technical、um, milieu like we are, there's going to be glitches. There's going to be mistakes,、um, and please just be gracious with us on this.、Uh, our tech folks is, are really expert, but they just have no control sometimes. So we will hang with them for a moment. Let's see if there's some other things we can do、uh, as they're working on this. We can.、Um, uh, can our Video folks, queue up our Board of Ordained Ministry video as we work out the technical difficulties of our legislation. That will give them time to iron out some of the kinks in that. Oh. Whenever you're ready, Bishop. So we're ready for the poll now. Okay.、Mm-hmm. Looks like they were able to do that very quickly. So I'm、um, sorry again to screw up our video, folks. Let's hold on that, and now our tech folks can put up the poll once again. So we're going to vote on 2002 one more time. All right. So wait for a poll to come up on the first one, 2002, page 69. There it is. Okay. Please vote now. Uh, we hope that Hawaii is—it's、um, popping up there. We、we'll, haven't heard anything yet from them. So, and we'll give you a little bit more time. A little frustrating because、um, when we're live with all of you, I could say, "Who needs more time?" <laughs> and look up. <laughs> and when you look up, <laughs> none of you are in view.、Um, so, are we getting the numbers in? Okay, we'll give you a little bit more. Okay. All right. Okay. Let us. Let us close、uh, the first、uh, legislation at this time, and we'll wait on the results. Or do you want to get them all together every time? Oh, here they are. Okay, very clearly in favor of that one. Thank you. Thanks, Leah. Go to the next one. Our next item is Recommendation Twenty Zero Three, which you can find on page. Seventy of the preliminary report. This is pensions item two, retiree health care. All right, it is、um, properly before us, and there will be a poll again on this one that comes up, and we worked out some of the difficulties there. So wait for the poll. There it is. So please vote now on twenty o three. Yeah, why don't we do a?、Uh, um, you you determine. Okay, I think、uh, I think you're catching on to this particular way. The polls are really helpful for us to concentrate. So let's close that poll now and wait for the results.、Oh, very good, and everybody's in. So thank you. All right, Leah. Our next item is recommendation twenty zero four, which can be also found on page seventy of the preliminary report. This is pensions item three, the clergy housing allowance. Bishop, I move recommendation twenty zero four. All right, is properly before us. Let's wait for the poll once again. Pop up on your screen. There it is. All right, please vote now 
in favor or opposed. 2004. Okay. Bob's working on a timer for us, but we'll give you ample time. If you're having any difficulties with um, the technology, just put it in the Q&A and our um, folks that are answering will get right back to you. Okay. Okay, I think we're ready to close this poll and let's wait for our results. All right, clearly in favor. Thank you. Leah? Our next item is recommendation 2005, which can be found on page 71 of the preliminary report. This is pensions four, supplement one to clergy retirement security program. Bishop, I move recommendation 2005. Thank you, Leah. All right, we'll once again wait for the poll to pop up. All right, it is there. So please vote in favor or opposed, and press, press submit, vote now. Oh, there's our timer. Okay, we'll, um, I think we've given you ample time for this. We will close this poll and wait for our results. All right, clearly in favor, thank you. Our final item for this segment is Rules 2002. You can find that on page 88 of the preliminary report. This is the endowment and lynch funds rule. Bishop, I move rule 2002. All right. Properly before us. Uh, we'll wait for the poll. There it is. So on 2002, please vote in favor or opposed and submit. Please vote now. Uh, well, since they already voted on it. Um, he's saying, I, I, I think there's a slight delay just in getting the information to us. So uh, I think that he is attempting to type it in before the poll is launched. I would rely on you. Okay. All right. Let's, um, the, we've closed this poll, and um, we've got a request uh, for tabling. Uh, but the poll has already been completed, so I'm sorry, and that's part of the technical delay. Um, you have to get these things before we start the poll, so I'm going to have to rule that out of order at this time. So let's get the results for the poll. Clearly in favor, so um, that will be the last one today? Yes, this okay. concludes our legislation for this time. Thanks, Bishop. Thank you, Leah. Appreciate it. Okay. Uh, I think we have a Board of Ordained Ministry report to come up, so let us um, begin that uh, pre-recorded report. Good afternoon, Bishop and members of the annual conference. Now, it could be morning when you're seeing this, and so I could say good morning as well, recognizing that we have recorded this earlier. But I greet you on behalf of the Board of Ordained Ministry and am grateful for the work of that board, not only in this past year, but throughout this quadrennium and even beyond that time. I am going to read the report rather than 
to give it to you in another way, and I ask your indulgence for the reading. In this most unusual expression of church, separated, digital, and perhaps even fearful, we can be assured that the body of Christ has served, often sacrificially, in the face of threat and denial, of doubt and oppression, even as it does today. As it is revealed by Christ Jesus, the Holy Spirit of God continues to stir and equip, to comfort and challenge, call and send. Out of his Church of England experience, affection and allegiance, John Wesley sensed the importance of clergy leadership. Others, his mother, Susanna, among them, would remind him that others were surely as called as he to preach the gospel. Educated clergy continues to be important to the Methodist movement, but we are becoming more aware of the gifts and commitments of the laity, whether they take up the tasks of preaching or continue to provide leadership to ministry. Most recently, the Board of Ordained Ministry has wondered how it might better serve and support local pastors. And we can be grateful that the fellowship of local pastors is being revived by the election of the Reverend Mr. Vernon Kemp to chair this gathering. Other current interests and concerns of the board focus upon perfecting our discernment of call and encouraging preparation for pastoring congregations, even those beyond local gatherings. In the matter of fellowship, though, the board initiates into the ranks of the clergy, and then it is the orders that builds connections that enrich and often humanize the multiple joys and demands of being pastor as has, has been announced previously, Martha Morales has been elected to chair the Order of Deacons, and Anna Mulford has been raised up by the Order of Elders to be its chairs for the next period of time. Recently, Bishop Hagia hosted a meeting of women and men who have now been elected to provisional and full connection membership as elders and deacons, and who now await commissioning and ordination. His usual hospitality of lunch and gentle conversation was curtailed, but his challenge continued. He and we wonder why people continue to place themselves in the hands of the local district and conference church in order to seek affirmation of call particularly in this era of great challenge from within and from without. And yet they come, and we will welcome them today, although with digital distancing. They represent hope as they offer themselves to servant leadership in the church. We rejoice in their call and in their willingness to take up this program of discernment. This program is carried out at every level by lay persons and clergy who give up time and talent, much time and great talent, to join those called in discovering the call of God to ministry. It is appropriate that at the close of the quadrennium to give thanks for those who listen and advise, who question and recommend, those who are people on the board. Today, permit me to raise up the names of laity and clergy who have come to the conclusion of their present work with the Conference Board of Ordained Ministry. Some have served more than 12 years, all offering themselves to the many tasks of the board. Therefore, we give thanks for the faithful service of lay persons, including Sharon Phelps, Alnita Dunn, William Lazarte, and Carl Bailey. Also, we can be grateful for the service of pastors, including Lori Doyle, Mamie Cole, Jane Voigts, 
Steve Peralta, Lenita Moa, Elena Uhamaka, Joseph Choi, Jim Brooking, Eugene Hahn, Jim Butler, Mi Su Park, Doug Williams, Brian Sakbu Lee, Ken Sir, James Stevenson, and K. Samuel Lee. Titles disappear in the midst of the work of the board as we learn to appreciate every member as a source of leadership and of blessing. Perhaps some of the lay members of the conference will now realize why these persons disappear for three or four days, four times each year. They were caught up in the important task, the work of the board. The new quadrennium is frequently a time for new leadership throughout the conference. We give thanks for the leadership team of the last four and six years. They have given much, often beyond the meetings of the board. James Stevenson and Tom Choi have served as vice chairs, while Albert Kim has offered his gifts to the work of registrar. Sun Young Lee has spent much effort in her work as provisional registrar, while Doug Williams and then Cherie Jones have coordinated the complicated work required of full connection registrars. Mark Ulrichson has overseen the supportive efforts of the Conference Relations Committee, and Vita Ward has kept pen and paper in hand to record the many decisions of the board's work. We were present together, were we present together, we could offer our thanks with applause. I would celebrate the diligent creativity and persist persistent dedication of these and all the board members. They have made the board chair's responsibilities tolerable and even enjoyable. We eagerly anticipate the contributions of those Bishop Hagia has asked to become a new part of the board and look forward to welcoming them at our October meeting. The board has elected laity and clergy to serve as the leadership team for this next quadrennium, with several continuing their service, but in other positions of leadership. Tom Choi begins his tenure as chair of the board, and Mona Lisa, Mona Lisa Tuitahi joins him as the vice chair. Sun Young Lee has been chosen to be the new registrar, with Diane Rayfield taking up the role of provisional registrar, and Amy Aiken leading as the full connection registrar. Gail Kendall has been elected board secretary. Greg Batson will oversee the budget as treasurer. Mark Ulrichson will continue as chair of conference relations. And Vita Ward will add her voice as a member at large. We are always grateful for the conference leadership of Bishop Hagia and the service of our cabinet representatives over these last years. And they include Jim Powell and Jan Wiley and now Melissa McKinnon. As a board, as candidates, as district committees, as a conference, even as a denomination, we are graciously blessed with the enthusiasm, the energy, the creativity, the dedication of Kathy Wilson, who is an invaluable resource to us all. Our thanks to her reflects but a small part of our appreciation for her labors, most of which go unneeded until need arises, calls are made, and information and wisdom is desired. It is then that Kathy steps forth to support and often guide the work of the board. Our thanksgiving for her devotion, her ministry, her diligence is offered, never as often as it should be, but at least on this day. 
though taking up the unexpected request to chair the board with some surprise and more trepidation, I rejoice in being a part of a warm, welcoming, and occasionally humorous community of people who have taught me much, have tolerated much more, and have been source of hope for the church of today and of the years ahead. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And now, what you have been patiently awaiting, let us greet sisters and brothers who will be commissioned and ordained tomorrow. Our registrar, Albert Kim, will lead us in this celebration of ministry. Good afternoon, Bishop Hagia, and members and guests of the California Pacific Annual Conference. It is my privilege to present to you the 2020 Class for Provisional Membership and Membership in Full Connection. For provisional membership and commissioning on the deacon track, the board presents Christy Ann Clark, Hyun Shim Hong, Kristen Marie Rex. For provisional membership and commissioning on the elder track, the board presents Leah Michelle Booth, Kung Doi Chao, Jessica Mieko Kawamura, Kurt Edward Poland, Alexander Stephen Powell, Hong Yun Won, Joy Grace Yun. For ordination as a deacon in full connection, the board presents Jinia Re Violet Moore. For ordination as an elder in full connection, the board presents Denise Ann Barnes, Benjamin Paul Camp, Rachel Michelle DeBoss Hagler, Hannah Ka, Yushim Michelle Park, Erin Karen Stenberg, Jacqueline Alejandrina Vives, Won Sok Yo, Joseph Yun. Here are the composite images of all of our candidates so that we can take a moment to congratulate them. I now invite Bishop Hagia to ask the Wesley's historic examination questions to those candidates who will be ordained and admitted into Full Connection membership. Very good. Well, we um, are excited about your ministry. When you stop to think about it, this is your beginning of your full career in the sense that all your board work will be over, all of the examinations will be done, and um, <clears throat> you'll be joining into the full uh, body and uh, a member of the order um, in the full sense of the word. Um, the orders itself were um, uh, historic in, in many ways, and um, I think we've sort of devolved it through the years. Um, earlier, the order was much closer because it wasn't as big. Um, there were smaller numbers. Uh, everybody knew each other. Um, but maybe you guys can um, re-energize the orders in some significant way. So we're hoping that this will be uh, a really lasting imprint on your lives and something that you'll rely on for the future. So without further ado, um, we will join together in answering these historic questions that Wesley put forth. First, have you faith in Christ? Yes. 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 Thank you. Go ahead and just say yes. Are you going on to perfection? Yes. 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 Thank you. Do you expect to be made perfect in love in this life? Yes. 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 Thank you. Are you earnestly striving after it? 
Yes. 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 Are you resolved to devote yourself wholly to God and to the work? Yes. yes. Do you know the general rules of our church? Yes. yes. Will you keep them? Yes. 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 Have you studied the doctrines of the United Methodist Church? Yes. yes. After full examination, do you believe that our doctrines are in harmony with the Holy Scriptures? Yes. yes. Will you preach and maintain them? Yes. 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 Have you studied our form of church discipline and polity? Yes. 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 Do you approve our church government and polity? Yes. 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 Will you support and maintain them? Yes. yes. Will you diligently instruct the children in every place? Yes. yes. Will you visit from house to house? Yes. yes. Eventually. Will you recommend fasting or abstinence both by precept and example? Yes. yes. Okay. Are you determined to employ all your time in the work of God? Yes. yes. And then the tough one. Are you in debt as to embarrass you in your work? No, 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 no. that's a no. <laughs> 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 We're going, yes, yes, yes. And, uh, Rachel, that was a no. Okay. <laughs> Will you observe the following directions? Be diligent, never be unemployed, never be triflingly employed, never trifle away time, neither spend any more time at any one place than is strictly necessary. Um, be punctual, do everything exactly at the time, and do not mend our rules but keep them not for wrath, but for conscience sake. And just go ahead and say yes on that final one. Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you, Bishop. Uh, th this is a wonderful time in your life. And as the Bishop says, you're starting out. And, and I have to confess that I'm ending up at least at this point. And I remember those questions throughout all of, I have remembered them throughout all of these years. And even though some of them are very difficult to carry out, they remain a framework in terms of trying to be faithful to all of the things that we are asked to do as pastors in the local church. So even though we can laugh about some of them, uh, particularly the one that has to do with being embarrassed because of uh, our debt, uh, they are transformative for all of us. So I, I have appreciated them. Thank you, Bishop, for inviting all of these people to respond to these questions. Wonderful. Thanks, Rich. And why don't you go ahead and bless us in prayer, Rich? Thank you very much for the opportunity. Let us pray. O creating God, who is Lord of all history, including our own, we give thanks for the challenges that form and transform us knowing that as we fully embrace such struggles, your spirit guides and empowers. As we respond to these opportunities to witness and grow, we give thanks for the women and men whose experiences provide inspiration and discipline for our, for our own serving, our own becoming, and ask that you fill us with the love, grace, and courage needed to live such evidences of our trust and faith. Be patient with us, O God of peace, and persistent as well, that we testify to your righteousness and hope for all through words and acts of healing compassion, of redeeming mercy, and of reconciling justice. For it is then that your saving will becomes our holy way. We pray this in the name of Jesus, your Christ, who seeks to be our Lord this day and always. Amen. Amen. In addition to those being commissioned and ordained, I present those who will be received by transfer from other annual conferences of the United Methodist Church. Esther Dang. Esther is an elder in full connection from the West Ohio Annual Conference and has been serving in our conference since 2017. She currently serves at West Anaheim UMC and have been there for three years. Mary Dennis. Mary is a deacon in Full Connection 
from the Baltimore Washington Annual Conference. She has been serving in our conference since 2018 as the change manager for the East and North District Unions. Beginning July 1st, she will be serving full time for the North District Union. And now, Ken Sir, Chair of the Order of Elders, will speak on behalf of the Order's Executive Committee. Greetings, sisters and brothers of the California Pacific Conference. Orders has continued to stay focused on supporting and caring for our clergy colleagues through various ways, but mainly through encouraging covenant relationships. And we are prayerful that all of us, uh, all of us Methodists in our local churches are raising up the value and living into these types of covenant relationships through various groups. It is the backbone and the way we will continue to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. It is the backbone of what made Methodism a true movement. You know, these are very stressful times, challenging times, and uh, heartbreaking times in many ways. I received a letter from my church member and, and, sh and she said, I feel strangely empowered to move in the authority of heaven because my heart is breaking. And that's so powerful. It is true that when our hearts break and when God breaks our hearts, it prepares us to be used in powerful ways to bring the kingdom of heaven near. All of us at this annual conference, if you're listening to this, you are a leader. We are all leaders in Christ's church today for such a time as this in this generation. And I pray in the midst of this pandemic and all that is going on, that we would focus on what are the ways, what are the ways of living, what are the ways we will live as a church so that we can sh make that shift from being a moment-based church to a movement once again, from being a monument-based church to a movement that we once were and the movement that Christ has called us to be now. It has been such a pleasure and I am so thankful for the quadrennium, the four years that I have been able to serve as the order's chair. I am grateful and I am hopeful as well for the new chair, uh, Anna Mulford, and, and the continuing chair of deacons, Martha Morales. I'm so grateful for their leadership and all those on the order's executive committee to continue to support and care for our clergy and to continue to care for the overall local church through our prayers and our service. May we continue to lead for such a time as this and may we continue to hope for the kingdom of heaven to come near. God bless you. Thanks, Ken. Bishop, this concludes the board's report for the annual conference. Thank you. Okay, we are grateful for our Board of Ordained Ministry and our orders and uh, fellowship of local pastors who represent all of our clergy in such a, a, a very strong way. Um, we did have a, a motion for reconsideration. Um, we're going to turn to that now. Um, there's a, been a couple of you who are concerned that the discussion, which normally would just naturally happen, uh, has been curtailed and agreed. Technically, we um, trying to be efficient and that is the reason for uh, this particular motion. So do we have uh, Rick Yules uh, to make his motion? It came in the, in the Q&A, but if he can have a chance to make it verbally, that'd be great. Can you hear Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Rick Yule, San Luis Obispo. Um, my motion is to move for the reconsideration of all legislation previously passed in this session to allow time for necessary questions and discussion. And Rick, were you voting affirmative on the original um, legislation? Yes, Bishop. Okay, that solves that. We do need a second. Uh, somebody just raised their hand. Just click on raise hand for a second. 
we have a second? Okay, very good. We do have a second. All right, it is before us. Um, there, this, this is debatable. Uh, so, again, the body can weigh in. If you would like to um, state something, then raise your hand, and then our tech folks will try to, to get to you. If you want to write something in, that's probably more immediate. We will get that directly. Any discussion? Can I suggest that if they want to uh, speak in favor or against, if they type into the Q&A, speak in favor or against, then our Q&A will manage the process. Very good. Uh, our secretary reminds us that if you want to vote in favor or opposed, be sure to put that into the Q&A, and that automatically pops up on a screen for us so we can identify those that want to speak in favor or against. Okay. Any discussion? Have we picked up anything? Bishop? Yes. Bishop, this is Denise. C if you look on the um, attendees, remember how we did it yesterday. Um, you can see who's got their hand raised, and Richard Bentley has his hand raised right now. Okay. If we could That's fine. Him. Can you hear me, Bishop? Yes. Okay. Um, I made the motion to table at the time that the motion was introduced. Why it wasn't recognized until we took the vote, I don't know, but it was timely filed. Um, and also I made, the re I made the point of order before the vote was announced. So I think we're dealing with some questions about the integrity of the process. Um, what we ultimately decide, I don't know if it will make a difference or not, but it's very clear that I think voices need to be able to be heard. If we were in person, we would have done this in legislative sections. There would have been a lot more time for discussion. And with the Lynch funds and their future, um, we're talking about a lot of money and a lot of time, and we really need to make them a wisely informed decision. Okay. I speak in favor of- Well, let's, uh, we have to first take the reconsideration and then you may go back. Well, I'm, right. I'm speaking in favor of reconsideration, stating what happened. So right. it's a speech in favor. Thank you. Okay. Okay. We have an opposition. Robert Shuttleworth is opposed to the reconsideration. Robert? I didn't hear. Uh, we need to uh, invite Robert. Um, you know, you talking technically, or do we need to invite him directly to speak? Yes. Okay, we're inviting Robert to speak. Please unmute himself. Uh, Robert, can you unmute yourself, and you may speak. We're still having some technical difficulties. Okay. Okay, we're still having problems getting Robert. To, uh, any, anyone else in favor or against? Okay, Tom Griffith. Yes, Bishop. Yes, Tom, go ahead. I know most of those motions are very routine with the exception of the one regarding the Lynch funds, but there's a lot of legalese that's in there and I think some of it needs to be at least brought forward so people can understand what it is. I, too many years I've gotten questions from people about something that was already passed and already in there, but Nobody knew it. So I think there needs to be some discussion about what these each motion is about. 
Thank you. Okay. Any others for or against the reconsideration now? Okay. That's okay. We have one who does not wish to speak in against the reconsideration. And I'm assuming that the earlier speaker who couldn't get on is against. So we have two opposed, two in favor. We can allow one more each. Is there anybody else that would like to speak to this? No? Okay. All right. I think you're ready to vote. So you are voting on reconsidering and bringing back the five pieces of legislation that, we, that you passed, okay? So then if you vote in favor of this, they will come back to you. You'll have the ability to have motions on them, debate them, etc. If you're opposed to that, then you will vote no, all right? Now, do we have a poll on this? We have a poll. That's helpful. Strict majority on this, on a reconsideration. That's fine. That's fine. They're working on the poll. Oh, here we are. Okay, if you would vote in favor of reconsidering, bringing back all those five pieces of legislation, vote in favor. If you're opposed to do that, press opposed and press submit. Please vote now. Right. I think you have ample time, and uh, we'll wait on our results. Uh, in favor, 36%. Opposed, 64%. So clearly, uh, you don't want to bring this back, so um, we'll move on. Thank you. And it, it is a difficult time um, to deal with a technical problem. Problem. So what we'll do from this point on, especially with legislation and items that are under consideration, is, is give you more time to digest the information, okay? So it's going to make it a little bit longer, but we want to be fair to everybody and be sure if you have a concern on something that's coming up that you are proactive about raising that. In other words, um, we didn't hear from Richard uh, on our technical side until the poll had happened. Uh, so uh, try to get ahead of the game, so to speak, and that is to try to prepare for things that are coming up. And we'll try to remind you of that one. Okay? All righty. Um, we're going to do uh, honoring our retired clergy in a video, but I do want to give a quick... Uh, uh, um, uh, prayer concern that has risen, and we also have uh, personal privilege from another person, but um, let me read this to you. Um, this is concerning Rosemary and Bob Davis. Uh, as many of you know, they have been such faithful and active uh, clergy in our conference, and um, her, their daughter Tammy has shared that um, they're both at, under care at Pilgrim Place, but Rosemary has been uh, diagnosed positive for COVID-19. She is asymptomatic right now and in no discomfort, but it is a concern. And um, let me read this to you. Wanted to share, Tammy wanted to share with us that uh, her love for the par her parents that are in decline and need of prayer. For the past seven months, they have needed to live in separate rooms because of differing levels of care. And this is the first time in their marriage that they've been apart in this way. Each has challenges with dementia, but often Rosemary will say to Tammy, I just got back from church. And Rosemary's memories are, uh, are taking her into the joy of the life of service in the church, which is a wonderful way to put that. And um, we, uh, their pastor, um, Reverend Karen Clark Ristine, has said, um, that Reverend Bob and Reverend Rosemary have transformed so many lives and so many faith communities. My prayer is that we can surround them in prayer. 
So let's take a moment in prayer right now because of their great witness and great history with us to be in silence as you uplift your prayers to them and I'll close. Oh God, we pray for Rosemary, especially at this time, that you would enable this virus to be mild and for her not to suffer any and be able to combat it. We pray for Bob and the fact that they can't be together physically right now. And we pray for Tammy and Wes who provide such good care for their parents. Oh Lord, do all you can to heal and surround them with your love. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, um, Gary, if we can get you ready after the video to share your uh, personal privilege, um, let's show the video now of our retirees, and then we'll end up with some announcements uh, that we have before lunch. Greetings, friends. My career in ministry began in 2006 at San Diego First, where I had the privilege of serving for 10 years with lots of wonderful clergy and lovely congregants. My call is to faith sharing and spiritual formation, and I was able to live into those through the Alpha Course, one-to-one -one conversations, small groups, retreats, uh, spring fling, etc. I transitioned in 2016 to DCG Strategies, and one of my favorite projects there was working with the design team in San Bernardino Mission Area to envision new beginnings, one church, in various locations. And that was a fun project. After that, I was able to work for over a year on a consulting assignment with my own church, with Pastor Brian Parcel and the Key Leadership Group, where we dreamed about God's dreams for 2030 for Chula Vista. And one of those dreams is to have fresh expressions, to have new spiritual communities out in the world. I had the opportunity of being in a nine-month pioneer learning community in Florida and learn best practices and ways to launch fresh expressions, to be the tethered church, both the gathered and the scattered church. And so my husband and I launched Game On, where we meet at our home and have a meal and games and uh, meet our neighbors and then worship in that setting. I've loved that experience. We are now transitioning and retiring a, a mile away. <laughs> and, and you see us in the constructions hats, you see that we have a vantage point. We can look out over East Chula Vista. We will see our neighbors, new neighbors, neighbors trying to form community, neighbors that are diverse, neighbors that work on Sunday, neighbors that have no experience of church. And we will offer them peace. And if it's returned, we will eat with them and be with them and help be their church, a fresh expression of church. Jesus said in Luke 10, the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out labors into the harvest. That's what I feel passionate about. Fresh expressions of church, to be both the missional and the attractional church, the gathered and the scattered, the steeple and the street, and that together, tethered together, we will reach the harvest. I hope that I can help you in, in this role as a consultant, as an advisor, and I would love to do so because I hope we will all see our neighbors and see that the harvest is plentiful. Amen. Growing up as a PK, church was my second home. My father is Reverend Rex Britt. Church was my extended family, the metaphor for God and Christ in my early faith formation and understanding of God. Love, do no harm, help people when they need it. And my call to ministry came in my 30s when I was in Haiti with a United Methodist team trying to figure out what I was supposed to do next. I was parenting two young daughters with my late husband, Steve Fisk. 
I went to Claremont School of Theology seeking answers and simultaneously embraced the consecrated diaconal ministry, which became ordained deacon. I was ordained in 1998. In 2000, my husband of 20 years, Steve Fisk, died of ALS. Our church, Aldersgate United Methodist of Tustin, became a living Christ for our family. It added significant layers to my call and confidence in entering darkness with others, knowing firsthand the role and healing place in caring ministries. New life came and resurrection was celebrated in my marriage to Dan Guerra in 2002. Dan has been and is a wonderful partner in life and in ministry. Since 1995, I've been appointed to three churches as a deacon associate, Aldersgate United Methodist in Tustin, First United Methodist Pasadena, Laguna Niguel Presbyterian, beyond the local church, and currently Laguna Beach United Methodist as part-time minister of pastoral care. Oh, that's four. My position has included children and family ministries at every church until currently, including directing at least 20 vacation Bible schools. I have continued my yearning to connect and make some difference with third world poverty by traveling to Zimbabwe several times. I'm currently appointed part-time in active retirement so I can be very present grandma, assisting with care with my two daughters and their four children under six. The encounters and work of the board give me hope for the future of the church. At its best, the church should do what Jesus did and does. Before anything else, honor the sacred worth and gifts of every individual, respond with abundant grace and forgiveness, and respond to darkness knowing that there will always be light and hope through all things. We need this more than ever. As I write this, we are in the middle of a pandemic and an explosion of reaction to the lynching of George Floyd. I hope that I've been able to bring some of that to the many children and adults I've known in ministry and practice and word. At such a time as this, I hope to find ways to continue that safely and to bring hope to the most vulnerable and isolated and dismissed. I am forever grateful for my call to ministry and for the United Methodist Church. Thanks be to God. Great. We are, um, I don't know if we had the identifications on the screen, but that was uh, Mary Almond Boyle and Debbie Guerra, who are, are both retiring, and we congratulate them and thank them for the witness and ministry all of their years, and will continue all of these years. Um, can we put up um, uh, Gary Williams, who has a personal privilege? Can you hear me now, Bishop? Yes. Okay, good. Greetings, uh, Bishop Hagia, and to my sisters and brothers of the annual conference. I'm Reverend Gary Bernard Williams, a pastor at St. Mark UMC LA. I want to thank you, Bishop, for this point of privilege. During our lunch break, um, Methodist Federation for Social Action, MSFA, uh, will be hosting our virtual luncheon. And uh, this year, we, would, we want to honor uh, Reverend Sandy Richards with the 2020 Mildred Hutchinson Award. We just wanted to invite uh, those who are able to join us on Zoom um, to just be a part of that great celebration today. And I can put the um, uh, meeting ID and password in the Q&A if that's okay. That is fine. All right. Jerry. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. And congratulations, Sandy. Much deserved. Uh, we celebrate with you. Yeah. Well, we're, um, Bob, do you have any announcements before lunch? We're going to take quite a while for lunch. You'll have um, uh, uh, almost two hours. Um, announcements? We're back, at two, we're, back at three. we're back at three. So uh, do you, again, recommend uh, that they don't turn it off or? 
one they can turn off. This one, I'm told that you can log out and then log back in with, uh, because it's a two-hour period. If you don't want to do that, you certainly can <laughs> hear music or whatever's playing. Um, so it's up to you. But again, we will start back at 3 o'clock and provide a sense of um, moving forward. And again, we will try to have more time for you to digest and to um, question anything that comes up in the future. Okay? Noon Hawaii time, I'm told, which uh, you'll get an early lunch. <laughs> so let us bow in prayer. Almighty God, we are grateful for this means, this technological means for us to be together, to stay safe, to allow people uh, the chance to be involved and yet be in their own homes or places where they are not exposed. Oh Lord, this is our hope and wish that amid the ravishes of this disease that we most of all keep our people safe and at and at low risk. So as we take this break, we are thankful for the bounty that you're giving us. We are thankful for every person who is on this call, and we are thankful for the richness of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray humbly. Amen. Okay, we'll see you at about three.